I don't, as uh, Dominic said, I speak German. I don't speak German, I don't speak philosophy. So I'm, I'm uh, far away on this panel. We have the amazing uh, Peter Schlotterdijk, a philosopher well known in Germany, and Peter Weibel, a media expert artist and philosopher as well. And you've heard Luciano, and what we want to talk about is the impact of this infosphere on our society and our lives. And I, oh, if my tablet will just, oh, I lost my quote from, from you. Here it is. So uh, w one quote, from, it's a very, very good book, Digital Revolution, um, uh, from Luciano. I want to I read one quick quote from that, because I think it, it sets up our conversation, which is that you said that we are slowly accepting post, the post turing idea that we are not Newtonian, standalone, and unique agents, some Robinson Crusoe on an island. Nice. Rather, we are informational organisms, inforgs you call them, mutually connected and embedded in an informational environment, the infosphere, which we share with other informational agents, both natural and artificial, that are also processing information logically and autonomously. So that is the sphere that we enter into, I think, and we want to try to look at the impact this has on society. I, can't, I was here the, last year on the stage uh, talking about uh, my hero, Johannes Gutenberg, and how his invention changed the notion of information in society, changed our notion of society and of ourselves, changed um, uh, the notion of nations and so on. So we go forward in a progression that these gentlemen have been brilliant at studying. And so, Peter Slaughterdijk, I'd like to start with you and talking about Luciano has a vision of a sphere. You do all your work in spheres and describing spheres and an evolution of spheres. How do you place this infosphere in our worldview and the change that is now brought to us? First of all, we have to consider the fact that this great Greek metaphor, sphira, is still one of the most powerful concepts when it comes to the question of how to redesign a, a, a concrete topology of contemporary existence. So we enter into a period where the discourse on spheres is restarting after the breakdown of the first cosmological talk, talk about, about spheres. So we, we, and also this term of infospheres uh, belongs to, to a broad field of new approaches to spherological thinking. In geography, uh, they talk about the lithosphere. This is the stone world. Yeah, it was a stone ring inside there. They speak about the biosphere that contains uh, uh, living organisms. We, we, uh, the term atmosphere uh, um, ha has become a, one of the basic uh, con concepts of contemporary concern. Uh, in Greek, it simply means uh, the sphera of mist. Yeah. Uh, Théa de Chardin when it comes to the humanities, has introduced the concept of noosphere, which, which is the, the intellectual envelope uh, that seems to keep living organisms on Earth together. Yuri Lotman, the great Russian se semiologist, introduced the term of semio semiosphere as a new uh, basic uh, concept uh, to, to, to the humanities. Regis Debré yeah, has made a contribution with, with four uh, spherological concepts, the graphosphere, the logosphere, the videosphere, and their integration into something uh, that he calls the hyper, hyper, hypersphere. Yeah. Uh, so, and in France, they start talking about something what they call jihadosphere. Yeah. Uh, which could be a, a new approach to the question uh, of uh, is Islam and its uh, trans, trans, transformations. Yeah? So all that reminds us the fact that uh, the second age of theological talking has started. And uh, my uh, approach to the concept of infosphere uh, could best be interpreted uh, by remembering the structure 
of the med medieval cos cosmology. Well, you know, uh, medieval men and uh, uh, cosmologists thought that the Earth is in the center of a, of a vast system of, of spheres, each, each of which uh, is determined by a celestial body. The sun, the moon, and, and, and five planets form a, a, a ladder or a, a, a system of en envelopes that are ultimately contained by a last envelope, a last sphere that carries the name firmamentum. Yeah, it is the sphere where the, the fixed stars were located. It is, as it were, God's condominium where he uh, uh, has uh, taken his, uh, his residence together with angels, sa saints, and immortal in intelligences. And, uh, and this firmamentum, the breakdown of the firmamentum, gave the initial push to that what we call the modern world. The real Copernicanian turn was, was, was not the fact that they discovered the heliocentric, this, uh, heliocentric system. Uh, the real breakthrough towards to, to modernity was uh, the uh, disparation, the, the annihilation of the firmamentum. And then so all of a sudden the Earth was alone in the, in, in the cosmos and had no ultimate container any, anymore. Uh, and I, my, my approach uh, to that concept of infosphere is that humanity is about to replace the lost firmamentum now uh, under, under the technological forms that, that help us yeah, to surround us in a completely new way by an artificial firm, firmamentum that is necessarily dynamic. It, it's not, not yet a complete container. 60% of humanity are, are still offline. Yeah. But there is movement, there is progress. There is this very strong uh, Matthew effect in, in, this, uh, in this system. You know, Matthew effects uh, go back to the famous saying of Jesus that he who has already will, uh, will be given even more and he, and he who does not have will be, will be taken away what he has. This has nothing to do with neoliberal thinking, but it is a, it is a naive and perfect anticipation uh, of what we call a positive feedback. That success leads to success. Virtuosity creates further uh, virtuosity and, 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 so for, and so forth. And riches create other riches. So, um, if I may bring in Peter Bible. Um, now, um, so you see this replacement of, of, of the organizational structure that we have in the world, and, and I go back to Gutenberg, of a me we're at a media conference, and so we think that media is rather central to the world too. We think that media control information. Uh, we had a business model that I think is, is what's really dying, is the mass media business model goes away. With it, the idea of the mass. That was a sphere that we were in. We were defined externally. Mm -hmm. Now we define ourselves in new ways internally. Media gets democratized. More people can, can be media now. You study media and art and, 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 and design. Um, and how do you see the impact of this notion of the infosphere on media or vice versa, the changes in media on the infosphere? Thank you for the opportunity to describe the deep effect of this uh, infosphere on our media. To understand this, I have to go back to the roots, to the sources of infosphere. We owe the infosphere to the progress of physics and mathematics, because physics allowed us to discover in the 19th century the existence of electromagnetic waves. Yeah? Before electromagnetic waves, everything that was transported or communicated needed a carrier of a message, a body, a ship, a soldier, whatever. Yeah? For the first time, when we discovered with electromagnetic waves, we could build devices to make use of it, to send voices, text images, wireless. 
without a messenger. So the first time the messages could be distributed without messenger. No? So we had the mass media, radio, television, and now the wireless internet. But what has happened is really not understood. No? What has happened is the following. In the ancient time, yeah, we had things and we could give the names to things. Yeah, but we could not turn a name to a thing. When I say it's a, a chair, I cannot say the chair becomes a, a real object. So the, the next step was we had things that we could, we could give images to these things. We have visual culture, we have philosophy, literature, etc. No? But finally, and, and we had even sounds. But now, with the mathematical with sphere of information, yeah, said, digitization, digitization means a progress of mathematical here in the world. And now, the first time, we can turn words into data in bits mm -hmm. of information. We can turn sounds in bits of information uh, in data. We can turn images. Uh, uh, so we, and finally, we can even turn things into data. And now, the first time, the printing, the first time in the history of media, uh, uh, we can say we have data. It turns into a text. Mm -hmm. And finally, we can, with the 3D printing, we can turn data into a thing. I give an example from our own institute, the Center of the Mind Museum, which is a research center. Some years ago, there was uh, uh, a robot at the Mars with two cameras. He made a picture of a thing, the surface of the Mars. So he turns the picture into data. The data has been transmitted wireless, remoted to Houston, and stored there. We know when we got the data from Houston, we built a robot and a program, and now the robot needs four months to make this picture again. Yeah? So uh, on another thing, we have a, we have a camera yeah? at the surface of the ocean near Vancouver, it's one square meter. This object, the wave, is turned to an image, then turned into data, remotely sent to that camera, to Karlsruhe, and turned into a floating object again. Yeah? So what is the revolution today yeah? is really uh, said we can data, said media can produce things. There's a famous philosophical book we discussed several times. It's called How to Make Things with Words. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But it does not function. Yeah? Today, with data, we can make things with words. That means we have certainly the first time a reversibility yeah? between real world, so called real world, and so called uh, uh, media world. And to say it abstractly, yeah? a little bit what you said in your last sentence about inscription, yeah? it's difficult. What we do now with the infrastructure, describe, uh, depict, uh, or inscribe. To make it more abstract, we can say today, by say, let's say data, it's infrastructure. Reality is what we can describe or inscribe mathematically. Uh, this is reality. Uh, so, if, so our media have changed completely our relation. To give a last example, Google is, in fact, not the future. Uh, because, as Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect, has said, uh, the 20th century was an equation called machinery, material, man. And I say the next century is the equation media, uh, uh, data, and man. No? And Google makes a mixture. Google has helicopters, but it's a transportation of goods. It's still 19th century. It's a transportation of goods with the help of the internet. Uh, but according to the disruption theory, it will vanish. Uh, because these people, people will come who understand the interference, that means you, you make a trans communication of information, of data, and then you turn it back into things. This is just now the threshold, yeah? mm -hmm. which we discuss. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So let me, let me play off. There's been a lot of discussion all day today, this being Europe and this being media, about data, data protection, Datenschutz, um, and the idea in a sense that we fear that we become our data, that yeah. this data is us, yeah. and if it's shared, it's a violation, and, and this, is, this is an issue. I see a larger question going on here about how we define ourselves, how we view ourselves, in what definition and sphere we put ourselves. Um, is the notion of a nation still valid? Is the notion of uh, the mass still valid? Do we define ourselves in new communities across the world now that we're connected across the world? Do we put ourselves in our own spheres? If that makes well, any sense, Luciano. Well, okay. last remark, what you said. Yeah? It changes even our uh, nature. A chicken, when you take the genetic code of a chicken, it is about 13 million data. Yeah? Our human genetic code is only three times as much, yeah. 30 million data. Yeah? So that means there's no big difference. And now we can start to think, how do we reprogram? Yeah? Yeah. 
not deal with, we had a, a very uh, mechanical view of, of, of us. You know, uh, we are bodies, we interact with the world, we do things, we change things. These are mechanics, uh, this energy, uh, dissipation, entropy, and so on. That's the kind of, call that the Newtonian picture of ourselves. Today, it's much easier, more natural, more intuitive to describe ourselves in terms of uh, who you are on Facebook, the kind of tweets you send, the search you have on Google, the taste you express on Amazon. You build a whole profile which is way more informational and therefore Turing rather than mechanical and therefore Newton. Now, I'm not saying that this is a good thing to do. I'm talking about what's happening in our society. We, to use a, a strong word for philosophers, we conceptualize, we understand the world in terms of information. So you ask someone, it says, what's DNA? Oh, it's like a piece of software. Information. You ask, what is a chair and what is reality? Oh, they talk about fields, time, space. What is that? Information. You talk about who is Jenny and Peter? I don't know, but they are your friends. Never met them. They are friends on Facebook. They are profiles. So this overall perspective, which becomes a sort of everyday philosophy is very informational. Do we want to take care of that? Yes. Are we identifying ourselves in terms of the information we share? Yes. Should we exaggerate in taking too much care of that? No. Relax. I give blood. I have my hair cut. It's my body and it's still not giving away. I donate my organs so I can give my data. In fact, actually, we're working in other contexts on a data donation protocols. You should be able to say, when I'm dead, all my data go to science. Why not? Professor Sloterdijk, um, how do you see distance? Physical distance now. If we move from the Newtonian world, we move that notion of distance and spheres. Mm. Do we as a society have the power to define what community we belong to, what nation we belong to, how we define ourselves? Is that externally defined still? Mm -hmm. Does this have any impact on how we see our relationship to our neighbors and our society? That's what I'm trying to ask. I think this infospherical reflection uh, must begin uh, with the concept of speed. Uh, uh, the infospherical reality is all about speed, a speed that destroys distances. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so it reshapes the world in terms of synchronicity. We, we, live, uh, we are entering into a completely new concept of reality because virtually everything will happen at the same moment or will be per uh, per right. perceived or realized in, in, in real time or in, 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 in with uh, minimal delays. Yeah? And this reality uh, of, of mini minim minimal delays yeah, uh, will <coughs> uh, make us jump into uh, a kind of reality for which we are simply not real. Not, not, not prepared. Yeah? We must not forget that in, in the antiquity, uh, when the, for the first time the concept of cosmopolis was, was conceived, yeah? this was a reaction to the fact that people were condemned to coexist in, in large social units yeah? uh, that counted up to 30, 40 million people. Uh, by the way, the, the Roman Empire uh, at the moment of, of, of its biggest ex extension, yeah, uh, was half the population of, of modern Italy. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, the, st the, st the stress of coexistence was so strong 
that they were condemned to reshape uh, the whole vocabulary, to develop a new grammar of humanity. And that's what we call humanities until, until today, yeah? because uh, the man as man had to be reshaped in according to the challenge of this co coexistential stress. Yeah? How to be, to, to be a neighbor uh, of 30 or the 40, 40 million people, how to, to become a neighbor of uh, the human race as, as a whole. And this coexistential stress uh, <coughs> has increased tremendously uh, in the age of, of synchronization and high-speed communication. And that's the real, the real challenge. Yeah, we have to learn to coexist uh, with six, six, seven, eight billion uh, co-inhabitants of this uh, uh, condominium called uh, planet Earth. Yeah? And we do, simply do not know how it works. Yeah? Because from our biological design, well, we are uh, animal uh, designed to uh, coexist with 20, 50, 100, 120 people, just as much as, uh, as your address book uh, can contain. Yeah? And now this expansion uh, is a real challenge. So this addresses our relationship with each other and with our environment and with animals. What about our relationship with technology? Part of what we also hear, I think, inherent in the discussion partly we had this morning is a fear of technology and the technologists and the power that they have through technology, the power they have through data. Data becomes um, a scary word sometimes when data is just information. Data is, is, is a pathway to knowledge, isn't it? So, so how, how do we, Luciano gave us some rules about how to make a better internet. How do you see our relationship with technology? The fear comes because rules, moralic or ethic rules, which have been developed in the analog time, don't fit anymore for today. Yeah? I'll give an example. No? The, old, the old analog world was uh, the logic of production. You produced an object, and then you could own it. Yeah? So you, when you, you produced a record, you could own the record. When you listen to a record in radio, you don't own it. Yeah? Uh, so like Jeremy Riffke describes it, and you describe it, now we are shifting by the data world into the logic of distribution. Mm -hmm. You distribute something. And this is the same, you can maybe share it, yeah, yeah? you can develop the common goods, but the concept of, uh, of possession doesn't function anymore. Yeah? So the logic of distribution means that our old rules, it's something is yours, doesn't fit anymore. Yeah? So, we, so we, can, we, we turn from an economy uh, of producer an economy of possession to an economy of usage, of user. No? And this is a very difficult shift. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, so many business models go wrong. Yeah, 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 because we don't have the rules. I give you the best example. No? In the Bible, the, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, number 10 says you should not envy yeah, your neighbor, his wife, uh, his uh, commodity and house. But you don't have the rule, you should not envy your neighbor's data. Luciano. You write about ethics. You look at the ethics of, of, of this world. I, I read a story this morning that there's a fight going on right now in the Bitcoin world, for example, where it's, Bitcoin is extra governmental. It has no governmental structure. Uh, a blockchain is trying to figure this out. Uh, there's a fight over the law of that community. There's a fight over what's right and wrong in that use of that technology. There's a fight over the law that we're creating. Professor Lawrence Lessig from Harvard famously said that code is law. Uh, law is an expression of ethics, ethical beliefs of society. You gave us advice about how to think of technology and the internet. How do you look at the ethical challenges we have to deal with in terms of creating new codes and structures and laws even around nations? That's, a, that's, a, that's an easy question. Uh, um, I think that there are a couple of risks uh, about the new legislation that we, that we need. Um, uh, the first risk is that we had decent solutions for the past that we want to upgrade, adapt, uh, but basically not change. Um, if you think of Europe in particular, uh, data protection, for example, we, we like to think that we got it right most of it since day one, and therefore we just have to do more of the same, just better of it. That's a risk, because it means that you are 
self-constraining yourself within a box that may be the wrong box. And I'm not saying we are doing a bad job. I'm saying we're not thinking in terms of true novelty. And I can give you, uh, for anyone here who has been uh, exposed to the right to be forgotten, uh, the example of the right to be forgotten. We probably need new rules. We can't simply tweak old rules to make sure that we get there. The second problem that seems to me an obstacle towards new regulations, as you were saying, therefore thinking afresh what we need to uh, develop, is um, to think that at some point there is no human responsibility, that we will delegate, we will outsource the ultimate responsibility for our decisions to some agents, corporate, hybrid, technological, but not us. As if there were some magic gods somewhere that they decide our life. That is a risk that we should not run because behind any bad decision, there's a human being. And we better take care no of prejudice. it. Right. I, I, it's been a crime to deal with these huge issues with these great brains in 45 minutes. Uh, so I'm over the line, but I'm going to ask one more question and ask for a, qu a quick answer. I go back to Gutenberg. I end with Gutenberg once again. To my mind, Gutenberg was a millennial moment, a, a change in society, a change. It created the notion of information as we have today. It created the notion of the container of the book. It created an industry. It created all kinds of things. Is the internet, is the connectivity of the whole world simultaneously at the same time, is that a millennial moment equivalent to the Gutenberg revolution in the book? Down the line. Yeah, anyhow, uh, it is the only uh, analogon that we have, yep. you know, ex except the cosmopolitan or uh, the revolution of philosophy in, a, in, a, in a antiquity. So uh, the only encouraging experience that the, the human kind ha has made so far is uh, the success of what we call Renaissance or the, 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 uh, entering the Guten, Gutenberg galaxies. Uh, uh, but we, we have to see uh, in the traces of, Ma of Marshall McLuhan that print, yeah, the, the printing te technology was also uh, a factor of, of world wars. You know? yes. That is, yeah. Uh, there's a dramatic chapter in, uh, in McLuhan's Understanding Media where he says, uh, where he speaks uh, about the press yeah, as uh, the archi architect of, of, na of nationalism. Yeah. And uh, in this, within this uh, big analogon, uh, there is an uncanny, uncanny element. Yeah. Better. In fact, it was not the alphabet. This is about it. It was just the mobilization of the alphabet. Eh? They said you had letters, and you could have something, you had mobile letters. So we should not give him an honor, we should not deserve. Eh? So in that sense, when you understand that when you have the printing process, when you have letters which are mobile, it's easier to make a book. But the book is still a carrier, a material carrier of information, which the internet is not. Eh? Yeah. So that means uh, the internet is in the, uh, everything what has to do with internet is a large, great, uh, large, great uh, invention than Guggenheim. Uh, so, so what we are now entering, so Guggenheim was a, a version of the infosphere, version light. Uh, but now with the data mm -hmm. and with the computers, like we have the heavy version uh, yeah. uh, of the infosphere. Uh. And what's wrong? Um, I think it's, um, it's a, part of that transformation, but it's a bigger than the Gutenberg transformation. Gutenberg is about recording and transmitting information. The internet is about recording, transmitting, and processing. Now, that processing doesn't happen in your ordinary book. Your ordinary book doesn't process that information. Your web page will process your information. Your internet of things will process your information. So it will be Gutenberg 2.0, if you allow me. Dr. Berta would like to ask a question. We have Mike, Dr. Berta. Yes. Who would wish to play him? The the big difference is that the Gutenberg Revolution was a, a semantic revolution. It was on on words. It was more the, the left side of the brain, 
And uh, what makes this fourth revolution so powerful is, is the iconic turn. It is, it is the icon. If you look what the young people around us are doing, uh, taking pictures, sending them on Facebook, and, and they can see Mr. Sloterdijk, Mr. Weibel, Lujano, and have some comments, but it's the iconic turn. It is, it is uh, the right, more the right side of the brain together with music, with motion, which leads to, especially in the generation of my children, leads to a new perception of the world. This makes it so powerful. And, uh, and with Facebook and with, with all the new technologies, this is the key. And uh, the, the power of images. And it will, it will never go back. The, it's OK. But it has a tremendous impact on journalism, on philosophy, on teaching. And when we heard today about uh, Tom Enders and why in so many managements in Germany the uh, reluctance has been so strong for not entering into the digital revolution. It was a generation problem that the, my generation is educated in, in, in text, in the left side, in, in what, what has done our education, our schools so wonderful. But we have to see this is probably gone and we have to adapt towards new technologies, and that's what could be called the infosphere. Especially the, the, the most interesting in the infosphere will be that the devices communicate with each other. <laughs> we, we don't know really what they're doing with us, but the devices communicate with us, and we can take a, no a notion. Yeah. Dr. Werner, this is why the first time I met you when you launched Focus Magazine way back many years and you came through New York, I've always admired you particularly for looking to the future and trying to reinvent what media is and what its role is in society. And you've made this company, uh, you've made that its goal. I think we are way over. Way over time. But I want to thank very much our, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.